so there was just a, a, a technical glitch and we were all uh, put out. Uh, I'm just going to um, finish off with the, with the introduction of um, Alex and um, uh, I think we actually were at the end of it, many of peer reprises, so um, that was that. Okay, so I think everybody is on. Um, I hand it over to you, uh, Matteo and, and Alex. Looking forward to this. Yes, I'm going to share some <laughs> slides. And then I'll let, can you see the slides? Yes? Yes. Okay. Okay, I will go, I will go first. So first of all, hi all. I'm glad you could make it to this, conf to this let's say, conference. Uh, our paper is called Encumber Security, Conceptualizing Vertical and Horizontal Repos in the Euro Area. Um, this uh, paper is basically part of a joint, a larger joint project between uh, Stefan Muhao, uh, Matteo and, uh, and me. And uh, as some of you already uh, know, because we already presented this paper at the, at the Money Bio Symposium, we are going to discuss at large about the repo markets in the Euro area. Like I said before, our uh, project, our repo paper that we are going to present today is part of a larger project. This project is based on a series of Geki studies started by Stefan Puhau as a part of a postdoctoral project uh, uh, within the Global Economic Governance Initiative. So uh, basically, the main idea of this uh, of our project is the like our, our the first Geki study shows the macro financial model of the eurozone architecture. Basically, uh, Stefan uh, used as not just uh, Stefan. Yeah, is basically the entire uh, international political economy literature that uh, started to see uh, the international monetary system as being hierarchical in nature, as uh, being a world spending payment system, if you want. Basically, every single institution, every single monetary jurisdiction is part of uh, is part of a complex web of interlocking balance sheets. Yeah. So basically, this was the main idea of the first Gigi study. Based on this Gigi study, Stefan uh, further analyzed the hierarchy of the offshore US dollar system. And basically, the euro area is part of that offshore US dollar system. This is also something that Bank of International Settlements argued as well. Uh, being stated that, uh, for example, European banks were involved in all these shadow uh, banking transactions before uh, the global financial crisis. And then based on these uh, two GEGI studies, we, uh, make, we make this argument that the Eurozone architecture is a dynamic system, again, based on a complex web of interlocking balance sheets. But uh, this, uh, this architecture suffered some notable changes with uh, the outbreak of the global financial crisis and then with the euro crisis so basically we uh, we show how the elasticity space of this system evolved over time uh, what kind of instruments emerge as a solution uh, what kind of public and private instruments emerge as, uh, as a solution of uh, this problem caused by the two aforementioned, aforementioned events and um, uh, basically, we uh, we started to imagine how all these balance sheets would look like. We tried to include all these instruments there ever be known to the mankind. For example, how for mortgage-backed securities uh, acted during the uh, global financial crisis, how repos uh, acted during the global financial crisis. But there was a problem when we start. When I first started uh, started working on this project together with Stefan. We perceived the repos as being, let's say, a simple instrument. Yeah, we basically abstracted from um, uh, from the security involved in the repo transaction. And uh, he, uh, in this moment, it's where Matteo came along. He uh, he said we we asked for uh, for his uh, for his feedback, and he said, "Okay, guys, I like what uh, what you've been doing, but there is a problem. The assets, the security of a repo transaction, is basically encumbered." And uh, we thought, okay, but uh, this might cause some, uh, might lead to some, uh, to some eyebrows being raised. And uh, we asked, okay, what we are going to do? We have this uh, legal, uh, this uh, legal approach of the report transaction, and we have this accounting treatment or this accounting uh, approach of uh, of report transaction. We uh, we said that, uh, yeah, you can. Uh, you can, yeah. Uh, we said, uh, okay. Uh, every single time, 
the security might uh, it's changing the the balance sheet when it's uh, is getting involved in a report transaction. But there was some problem that we find uh, basically discussing all these things. So um, here we have uh, uh, in, in the introduction we have the notation on balance sheet of a report transaction. As I already mentioned, we have the literature on shadow banking system, and all these shadow banking scholars basically discuss report transactions as uh, in, a, in a different way. For example, Merling and Posa tend to, like we did before, to abstract the security from um, uh, fr from the actual uh, report transaction, yeah, they are not going to to get into detail of uh, of how how uh, security changes some balance sheets or not. Uh, Gabor and Vestegar, for example, consider the report tra uh, report transaction is basically the only form of shadow money uh, existing because this this the only form of shadow money that led to the actual money creation which uh, we are going to show is not always the case because you have to think uh, through a hierarchical lens when you are discussing the uh, the money creation or not and uh, basically this is uh, this is uh, our uh, the the gap we identified how we can basically uh, have this legal claim and, and uh, this legal approach and this accounting approach of report transaction in on on balance sheet in an actual report uh, transaction how uh, can this uh, uh, these two approaches can be used to show the creation of a repo IOU or IOU, uh, how uh, traditional money creation is taking place, and what happens basically with the security that is used as uh, collateral. Okay, so um, we are uh, discussing about uh, the money creation, the traditional money creation. We, uh, we've uh, found out that there or we argue that there are two different repos, uh, vertical repos and horizontal repos. Uh, as I already mentioned, we have this hierar hierarchical um, this hierarchical system. Yeah, uh, what does it mean? For example, when we have horizontal repos, we are discussing about two institutions that are basically at the same level, like two banks, as we have in this uh, example. Uh, for example, when uh, let's say a central bank, ECB, the euro system, or any other central bank creates uh, central bank money, we have basically a closed system, meaning uh, this central bank money can't be destroyed by a lower hierarchical institution. For example, bank can destroy this uh, central bank money, only the central bank can do. So basically, we have this pre-existing uh, reserve, pre-existing central bank money, and the basically institution land on, on this pre-existing reserves. And in this process, we, like we have for the bank A, we have a minus reserve because, okay, when you engage in a repo transaction, you basically lend uh, this reserve to another bank. Uh, bank B has reserves as assets because they uh, get a reserve, but they get this reserve by using a repo transaction and in this process by using a uh, collateral. So basically in this process, uh, there are no money creation, as we know, because these banks lend on pre-existing money created by the central bank. But this thing uh, changes when we are discussing the vertical uh, repo. So when we have when we discuss the vertical repos, we have basically two different layers. We have uh, in this example central bank and the bank, or we could have I don't know a bank and the hedge funds, for example. Well, when we are discussing a vertical repo, we are discussing the possibility of money creation through this swap of IOs. For example, when uh, when a central bank, when a bank needs uh, funds, need, needs reserve, uh, have the, uh, comes with a collateral, uh, use it as uh, in, a, in this process with a central bank, and they get reserves. Uh, as you can see, bank as a repo borrower, gain reserves as assets, and the uh, repo became a liability because all these transactions are reserved. In uh, 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 central banks, for example, have uh, repos as uh, an asset because this is a process that uh, central bank engages with a bank, and uh, basically they have liability, uh, they have reserves as liability. In this process, we can see that basically. Uh, there are money. Uh, uh, there emerge a process of money creation because 
bank in this process gets reserves. So when we discuss the manipulation, we have to make it clear that it's not always the case, only when we are discussing the, uh, the vertical repos. Okay, and here is this uh, where the story gets interesting uh, for us. We have, uh, like, uh, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, we have the legal treatment of repos that basically was at the front seat of these uh, discussions uh, in the literature of IP scholars or money view scholars. And we have our, uh, the accounting treatment of repos where uh, the collateral gets encumbered. So, as, uh, as we can see at the legal treatment of repos, basically the collateral changed the balance sheet. Yeah? When you engage in a repo transaction, you uh, give away that uh, collateral, the collateral goes to another balance sheet, you get your reserve and everybody is happy. But basically, this uh, we realize that this process is a bit more complicated. Uh, for example, we have again two, uh, two different institutions on and horizontal uh, repos. We have bank A and we have bank B. When uh, bank B wants to get reserves, they uh, they have this uh, this collateral, this asset. Uh, basically, they held uh, they held this uh, securities all right in a classical uh, sense of of the of the term. When they want to use this uh, security as a collateral, basically that collateral is not going to be held all right uh, no more, and it uh, and becomes encumbered in a repo transaction. Uh, in uh, as we can see, in the case of the bank A. We have a security e, a X pledge as collateral from uh, from the bank B, but it's held in, in an off, off balance sheet uh, position. Uh, basically, this uh, off balance sheet position is something that we we understand from looking at the Deutsche uh, Deutsche Bank uh, the right matter the Deutsche uh, Bank report, and uh, they have this off balance sheet position position where they held where they hold all these uh, se securities pledged as collateral. So basically, in the, in this um, the, the, this is basically what uh, uh, this is our gap, and this is how we understand how we should act on it by looking at how at what happens with the security the security is, is not going to be part of the uh, bank's a balance sheet but it's uh, basically part of an off balance sheet position but uh, the the interesting uh, the, the interesting thing is uh, you get as as a bank just the legal claim of that uh, security the security basically never leaves the balance sheet of the bank of the borrower because uh, this is what happens. Uh, this is what happens with um, with uh, banks, uh, for example, in Germany. Like I give the example, uh, the example with uh, Deutsche Bank. But this is the case of uh, any other uh, other banks in uh, in Europe. And um, uh, this is uh, where uh, we are going to. Uh, this is what we are going to to discuss further. Um, before um, delving in the details of the vertical repos. We also have this, we, we should have this discussion on the collateral framework and how this collateral framework basically impacts the, the elasticity space, how Stefan Buhau called it in his first uh, Gege studies. For example, we have again a central bank here, we have a, a vertical repo. Yeah? We have central bank as a repo letter and we have bank, bank as a repo, repo borrower. Uh, the central bank as being at the apex of the monetary hierarchy basically impacts elasticity space on lower uh, on the lower layers of the hierarchy by modifying the list of eligible collateral. Yeah? Uh, for example, uh, a central bank can say, okay, we are uh, accepting from now on only, I don't know, asset-backed securities as uh, collateral. In the exact same moment, basically the elasticity space of the Euro area will be uh, will be uh, diminished because you only have one class of assets that you can use as uh, as uh, collateral. Uh, and basically, bank being on a lower layer of the of the hierarchy, it must have these securities uh, like we uh, we have in this uh, balance sheet. We have securities held outright and encumbered securities. Basically, the securities held outright could be used 
in a repo transaction with central bank only if they are accepted by the collateral framework developed by the central bank. Yeah, because if you're if you have only I don't know government bonds and the central bank say okay I don't want any more I don't want any government bonds I don't want, I just want only asset securities then you are not going to be able to use them in a repo transaction. Yeah, only in a transaction with another uh, with another bank. And so um, here. Yeah, matter just a bit, please. Okay, okay. So uh, the, the most important thing that we should remember from uh, from this slide is, um, uh, then the moment a central bank changes the collateral frameworks, basically the uh, the ability of a bank to to uh, to get involved in the repo transaction is. But basically, uh, is, uh, is is diminished if they are modifying uh, this uh, uh, this collateral framework uh, in terms of reducing the asset class that they are accepting as collateral. And uh, basically, this balance sheet methodology is uh, this uh, collateral framework is going to be analyzed further by uh, by Matteo, where he shows all these changes that uh, took place in this uh, collateral frameworks after the outbreak of the global financial crisis and then after the euro crisis. Okay, so I'll take over now. Um, so in a, in a sense, uh, what Alex just presented uh, is the, um, the, the theoretical and methodological contributions that we make. And that really, uh, it really um, stem from our belief that the literature essentially discuss, discusses the repos in, in a way that is not coherent with what actually, uh, what actually happens. So to, to, to theorize our, uh, our understanding uh, of repos, what we did is really just started by looking at uh, what actually central banks record. And in our specific case, we looked at what um, the, the, the ECB or the, the Euro system uh, records. And uh, it became clear to us that uh, monetary uh, that monetary policy with uh, uh, with vertical repos, okay. So these um, vertical repos, as, uh, as Alex just described, these are open markets uh, operations essentially, uh, do not involve the recording of the securities on their balance sheet on the on the ECB, on the Euro system's balance sheet. So <laughs> in a sense, it is coherent with what we just said. The the, the securities never really leave the balance sheet of the bank. Um, that is uh, that is uh, uh, posting the security as collateral, because what the what the central bank, what the what the any of the national central banks in the eurozone um, record are just the liquidity provided, the, the value of the liquidity provided, not the actual uh, not the actual security. This is crucially different from the monetary policy carried out uh, through outright purchases. purchases such as uh, the various asset purchasing uh, programs that, that we've seen since 2014. So in, in a sense, in, in which, of course, you actually see that the, these are uh, securities that are now uh, recorded on the balance sheet of, of the central bank, and uh, in a sense that point out precisely at the difference between outright transactions and, uh, and repos. And uh, this goes to, 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 to show the, the, the point that we make that Repos do not entail the movement of uh, of the securities from one balance sheet to the other. Repos only remain um, only affect the securities in that they move from outright to being held uh, as encumbered. And what really moves from one balance sheet to the other, if you want, is this uh, legal claim uh, on that security. Uh, very briefly, both create liquidity. Okay, so both. Uh, um, monetary policy operations uh, through repos and through uh, outright uh, purchases create liquidity, as can be seen uh, from from this graph, in which in the first panel we have the uh, the, the, uh, the the various programs in uh, it, it, the lines with uh, with the uh, colored in red that uh, tells us uh, the, the various mm, um, the various uh, repo uh, repo operations. Whereas in the second panel we have the um, the size of uh, the the liquid the liquidity provided with uh, with the outright uh, purchases. Uh, so the point is both create liquidity. Why do they create liquidity? Well, because these repos are actually vertical repos, and hence uh, it, it supports uh, what Alex just explained. 
Now, uh, this is the, the um, uh, empirical origins, if you want, of our, of our um, uh, accounting uh, uh, approach to, to repos. And so the, the next step that we really wanted to, um, to, um, to tackle is, okay, we have this approach to how to account for, uh, for repos now. Can we now integrate this with the collateral framework? So can we actually manage to show the uh, changing collateral frameworks through balance sheets, because this uh, the qualitative easing, if you want, uh, is uh, uh, played a, a key role. Quantitative easing and tightening played a key role during the various uh, rounds of uh, of financial instability in the eurozone, and so, and nobody really um, uh, was able to, to to integrate collateral frameworks in the um, uh, in the show uh, in showing how balance sheets expand or contract uh, accordingly. So uh, why does the collateral framework uh, matter? Well, uh, it matters for both vertical and, and horizontal repos in our arguments because collateral frameworks uh, are imposed by central banks to, um, to the various uh, commercial banks when they acquire uh, liquidity. And collateral frameworks, especially in the Eurozone, they are also um, uh, created and, uh, and managed by the central counterparties and uh, through the various uh, collateral bar uh, baskets uh, for the various um, operations that uh, entail uh, clearing through the CCP. This is particularly important in the European case because of this uh, in incredible feature of, of the European repo markets. And that is that 70% of security transactions were uh, centrally cleared as 2020, which essentially entails that changes in the collateral framework at either level really will affect the, the um, uh, elasticity space and the liquidity that uh, can be provided. Uh, crucially, CCPs and uh, central <coughs> banks have different, and the ECB and central banks have different uh, collateral frameworks. But what is also true is that CCPs have, ten, have tended to, uh, to follow the uh, ECB's adjustment. In terms of uh, of balance sheets, what we do is um, it, we can we can start with the example of of, uh, of the national central bank balance sheets, and uh, we uh, represent graphically this idea that uh, there are these repo operations that can be uh, drawn on to uh, access the the central bank um, uh, liquidity facilities, and. Uh, in our example, as of 1999, these, uh, the, the, these repos can be drawn upon through um, uh, by posting collateral that either applies to tier one securities or tier two securities. What we, uh, what we, found, what we find is that, of course, the, these collateral frameworks have changed throughout time. But uh, what we really uh, wanted to show is that the expansion in this collateral framework is what matters. Okay, so in a sense, our our uh, our accounting methodology for repos and this integration of the legal and um, accounting sides of it allows us to show precisely when quantitative and uh, sorry when qualitative uh, uh, easing uh, or, or tightening occurs by showing when balance sheets have the potential of expanding and providing more liquidity because their collateral management has changed. So clearly, from the move from 1999 to uh, 2023. So the, the, the collateral, the collateral framework of the uh, of the ECB uh, has changed uh, uh, several times. But if we just take two snapshots from 1999 to 2003, what we really to, to, to 2023, what we really see is this expansion in the uh, in the uh, securities that can be used for uh, for repo transaction with the with the central bank, and as a consequence, is an expansion of uh, the elasticity space, the potential liquidity that can be, uh, that, that can be provided. Uh, we, we can do the same with, cent uh, with central counterparties, okay? We take the example of, of Eurex clearing in, in this case, and we show that as of, 20, uh, as of uh, 2005, um, the uh, repo operations could occur against the general collateral basket that uh, uh, if you were, uh, I suppose last year, at the CCP conference uh, you might have heard of. And uh, essentially with the general collateral basket, all, um, uh, all government securities were, uh, were, treated, uh, were treated the same together in this collateral uh, pool. And uh, um, what happens crucially is that 
we see fragmentation appearing after not the eurozone crisis but after the the, the global financial crisis and we can show graphically now that what happens in terms of the balance sheet of the CCPs is that these uh, these VIP operations, rather than being um, that been uh, rather than being against the eligible collateral uh, of the general collateral uh, basket, now they become eligible against specific general collateral basket based upon the origins of the uh, of the collateral, based upon the the the, the, the issuance uh, of the collateral. So uh, again, in a sense, this. Uh, this story of how collateral frameworks change hasn't really been captured and uh, hasn't really been um, formally captured in, in, in together with the expansion and contraction of balance sheets. And our uh, our approach to to, to show to, to show it this way allows us to put at least uh, uh, an idea of uh, of how uh, central banks and uh, central counterparties balance sheet can potentially uh, uh, change based on these changes in how uh, in the collateral framework. Um, so this is in, in a sense our, uh, our contribution. What then we, um, we thought of is, okay, we, we have this, uh, we, something that we think is quite accurate and uh, more complete that the, than anything that the, the, the literature has offered. Uh, is it really um, is it complete or is it generic uh, enough? And so we looked at the the, the special cases, or we looked at uh, to to be more consistent with uh, the the real nature of repos and uh, in a sense their systemic features by um, thinking about what happens when collateral is being reused. How does the reuse of, of collateral affect? Our uh, accounting methodology for uh, for repo operation, and uh, this uh, might look a little complex, but it's uh, it's not really. We are just merging together a couple of the balance sheets that we've uh, already seen. If uh, in the case in which uh, our banks decide to reuse collateral, which happens uh, uh, very commonly, and uh, that's as I said, underpin the systemic feature of, of repos. What happens is that. If we suppose that Bank B is our original uh, borrowers through an horizontal repo from Bank A, then you can see that the first part is a simple, uh, a simple uh, horizontal, uh, a horizontal repo at a time zero, in which the security becomes uh, uh, encumbered from from outright, and the reserves change, uh, and the reserves are moved from Bank A uh, to Bank B. The moment in which Bank A then decides to reuse the collateral. What, what happens? The, the question is, what becomes encumbered? Because okay, at time zero, it was clear we had the security on the balance sheet that now could be moved from being held outright to being encumbered. So what happens with uh, with bank uh, when bank A wants to reuse the the collateral, the security that it received as collateral for another repo operation? Well, our understanding is that well, well what happens is that the security is not used as, as as collateral any longer. What is being used as collateral is the legal claim on the security. So in a sense, we don't have a, another uh, encumbrance of, of, the, of the security, but we have this changing position in the off-balance sheet uh, position of Bank A, in which the security that was held as, uh, as uh, co um, uh, the, the security that was held as claim uh, um, from Bank B is now being used the legal claim on that security is being used to um, to access uh, Bank C and to draw the re uh, on the repo with uh, with Bank uh, with Bank C. So, it, it, in a sense, it, it is coherent, and uh, the, this inclusion of, uh, of of balance sheet position allows us to show that repos are a bit more complicated. They, we have uh, encumbrance of securities. When the repo are actually when the uh, when the securities are held on balance sheet, but when we reuse collateral, we do not encumber uh, securities. Rather, we have changes in the off balance sheet positions of uh, of the legal claims on uh, on the uh, on the securities, and uh, um, this, however, doesn't um, doesn't create any issues uh, with our methodology, and and on the other hand. Uh, pro uh, provides uh, a systemic feature that, um, as Alex uh, mentioned at the beginning of the, our presentation, other accounting uh, methodologies cannot uh, cannot really provide. 
Okay, thank you, Matteo. So um, I will uh, get straight to discussion, basically, and then the co conclusion. We uh, we sought to pro to provide a basically a more complex view of repos. Uh, we wanted to sh to show how. Uh, um, uh, why we need to to discuss the hierarchy of the institution to basically to shed light on the uh, on the actual money creation activity uh, we also wanted to show how basically collateral frameworks evolved uh, over time because uh, they can uh, this collateral framework can impact basically like we already said several times uh, can impact the elasticity space on the lower layers of the of the hierarchy we showed basically uh, at the same time that uh, we provide basically a repo model to to call it as this way that simultaneously shows how uh, creation of a repo io take place how uh, the potential creation of traditional money emerge emerges and what happened with the security that is used as collateral basically we uh, we wanted to, to show that a repos uh, should be understood both through a legal and accounting uh, and accounting uh, lens uh, to fully understand the role these repos and the impact these repos uh, have on uh, on the uh, in, on the monetary uh, hierarchy um well as uh, as a conclusion we basically have uh, several questions um uh, as uh, you can see already on the slide we just want to hear from you guys how do you find our distinction of horizontal and vertical repos uh, do you find some merits uh, in the encumbered asset swap and our uh, legal and uh, accounting treatment of uh, of uh, of the collateral uh, and uh, another interesting question for us is how do you uh, do you think the reuse, the reusing of the legal claim of the collateral in the, the reusing process, uh, um, uh, is? Or do you think it makes sense to, to, to have it this way? Do you would you change uh, anything else? Do you think uh, it's uh, basically not, um, let's say, it's not realistic? Or uh, I'm really curious. Uh, how do you see? Uh, as for the uh, for the last question. Um, yeah, we say and basically we extend on this uh, new notation style for repos, but we are really curious if you see uh, some contribution, uh, a different contribution of our uh, paper. Do you think we should uh, put the focus more on other aspects of the paper uh, or not? Thank you so much for, uh, uh, thank you for, thank you so much for your attention. Well, uh, thank you, Matteo. Thank you, Alex, um, for your presentation. Um, so we're now going to move to the discussion part of it, and um, I'm going to stop the recording uh, for the first uh, discussion and then put on for a second um, so that uh, Iona can speak freely uh, without any um, uh, hesitation there. So, so let me just do that here for a moment. I'm going to start the recording. Or con the continuation of the recording is now happening. Um, now uh, it's um, my turn to introduce uh, Gottfried Dewitz uh, uh, to us. Um, his uh, reputation on repo proceeds, um, and you are open um, to complete my introduction to you, as I um, haven't had um, maybe not all information. But Gottfried started his um, career in 1972 at the Belgian uh, Bank and had several stops um, internationally. Um, in, in this private um, uh, banking, uh, sorry, in, in this, in, on the private side of the financial system. And in uh, almost 25 years ago uh, at uh, uh, ICMA, the International Capital Market Association, uh, he started uh, the uh, European Repo and Collateral um, Council, which is probably, um, which, 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 which was cited by the researchers as one a source um, and with that, uh, Gottfried, I let you complete what I have forgotten and turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I already apologize to Alex and Matteo if it becomes a bit heavy, right? But take it as constructive and not negative because I know my own style of talking. But I didn't mention before, uh, Gerard, is that I was also a member of the Giovannini Group since 1998. The first Giovannini group, the study was uh, where Peter Pratt uh, was invited as uh, chief economist from General Bank, was about 
bond market. And the next year they had uh, to, they were looking at triple market. And I remember on a Monday morning at quarter past eight, he told me, are you in the bank? Yes, jump in the taxi, call with me to the commission. I have no clue what triple is about. And you have to sit there. And I stayed all the time with the uh, Giovannini group, right? One and two. Um, I'm still unfortunate. Uh, 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 another observation is that repo is still not understood, not by politicians, not by European Commission, some people, and certainly uh, I have a bit of question marks about academics and their understanding of what is a true repo market. But first, before I go on, I, I have two, three questions, uh, particularly Mac Matteo, at one stage you said illegal claim or was it legal claim? You mentioned that in your presentation. Do you really mean an illegal claim or was it just a claim? I misunderstood. Legal claim, yes. A legal claim, not illegal claim. Okay, that's no legal, legal, yes, helpful. not illegal. Yeah, okay. Yes. You could have phrase my a second thing is um you use only your ex GC pooling for for your deeper analysis. And I and I have had read something like this as well from a university of uh, St. Gallen a couple of months ago and, and years ago. Um, if you want to study the repo market, you have to look at bilateral, triparty, CCP cleared, buy side and sell side. So the sample you see from um, the ERC repo service over 10 trillion outstanding, that's only banks, only 70 institutions. So this is only the minimum outstanding in repo transactions. So if you go to Eurex, uh, it's much, much smaller. And then the second point I have, 70% of the market is not the correct number that's cleared. It actually on page 23 of the repo study, you will see that CCP cleared coming from electronic trading systems is 18.1% of the 10 trillion outstanding. And CCP cleared post trade, so you do the trade and then you push it through the CCP, is only 5.7%. So basically we have from the, the data from ICMA, only 25% is centrally cleared. Okay. Then a third thing, um, which is for everybody, repo is um, reused. Rehypothecation has nothing to do with repo. Rehypothecation is for instance, when there's a legal claim on, uh, on, on a, a certain piece of collateral, then it can be rehabilitated. But the, the name to be used is reuse. And I remember in the European Parliament, uh, showing around, I gave 50 euro to somebody and it went around the room. And there was a fail, of course, and I didn't get my 50 euro back because but it, we re reuse that 50 euro all the time. But and at the end, you know, we still have fails in the market. It was a good example why the system isn't still the way it should be thing. In case of a default, then you have another accounting treatment. So, you know, and I come back to the Lehman case and so. So in the repo transactions under the global master rate agreement for security lending, the global master security lending agreement, um, you, um, are, when you take it as collateral, it's not yours, you just use it. It's only when the counterparty from which you got it goes bust, then it becomes your position. Then you have the risk on the underlying bond market, but not in the repo. The repo market actually functioned very well. And one of the things from God and the metric, that's absolutely untrue. Repo was not the cause of the crisis. The cause of the crisis was securitization. As uh, in the asset bags, market bags, uh, uh, real estate uh, loans given to um, Joe Public, who actually didn't even have enough money to pay for food. And so this was the, what caused the crisis. And the repo is only the tool through which we refinance everything. And I have a concrete example on ESG, right? Climate change. We have huge debate for two years in ICMA that there is no green repo. The repo market can finance green assets, but green repo doesn't exist. Can you imagine if a trader who does, we do short-term trades most of the time, right? We have special evergreens, so your people, in, there was a, a, I think it was a deal between Deutsche Bank and Turk, a Turkish company where they have a five-year evergreen. So that's a five-year loan of cash against this underlying water dam or whatever it was, I don't know, which is refixed the, the rate every three months. 
but normally a repetitive job very very short and so um that's a problem when uh, there is a default when there is anxiety about uh let me go back now to the to the Lehman crisis the repo market worked till the close of Los Angeles that Friday night on Saturday repo traders in the big banks were talking to each other to change their balance their, their tripartite positions that they had with Lehman one that short what was wrong to compensate them through the trading to the cleaning systems the Fed actually asked Trioptima who is the compression and I used to work for them as well, uh, to open the system to compress live trades on Sunday morning, New York time, against all the positions of Lehman so we could reduce the, the, the huge outstanding from Lehman to a minimum. So it would have been much easier to unwind it. Our staff traveled to New York, but the banks weren't ready to do this. So this is one of the systemic risks that you sh should keep in mind. You know, whether the crisis like the Credit Suisse one or the Silicon Valley Bank, now we are ready to act, but it's not never repo. Repo finances under the global master rate agreement. And what you will see when there is a crisis, we will increase the haircuts. So the margin you take, you know, above the normal exchange of the cash bond price and the repo market uh, financing to from 5% to maybe 100%. And what does the ECB do? Similar to the banks and the buy side, I must say, when you have a, a, a kind of collateral that you can see da, going down the drain, the ECB prices that collateral as zero worth. So it's kind of disappeared from your position. And that's how it works. And I can give you the example of Greece to make you understand. I was very much involved in the, before the Greek default, I had meetings with the central bank, with the Ministry of Finance, um, with, with a Greek colleague actually, who is, I won't mention his name, <laughs> but uh, I got a call, one, Monday, one morning when I walked in a conference in London from the head of the Greek treasury, Gottfried, you have to go against this article in the Financial Times. We don't help speculators. We want to make sure that there's liquidity in the Greek bond market. And what happened? The politician forced buy-ins. That minute, the market collapsed and it took years to revive a bilateral repo market. They still don't go to CCP. Nobody wants to take that risk, although Greece is doing very well at the moment. So, so I agree with Alex. The repo market is very complex. It's a very simple technique, but it's very complex. There was a last thing that on your last slide, you mentioned notation as a style for repo. Is it novation or no, what, what do you mean by notation? That I didn't understand. The very last yes. line. No, no, it's, it, it is notation because um, what we what we see is that, as you mentioned, uh, so we approached this question, and of course, we before we we wrote this, we we looked at the literature, and the literature mm -hmm. doesn't have a unique way of uh, of approaching repos. Some uh, again, without defining what repos are, some treat them as swaps, some others as the creation of of, of claims and liabilities, and uh, what, what we what we what we say is essentially that. Yes, there are all these notations, but none of these notations actually captures what all all the dimensions yes, of yes. repos. Okay. So what we right. try to do is to provide a notation that is better, I think, uh, uh, capturing the fact that the uh, as you mentioned as well, the the, the the security doesn't leave the balance sheet until, of course, it, it, it it's defaulted on. And uh, yeah. they are actually recorded on this off balance sheet. And what uh, and um, and so on. So it really, it's the notation that uh, okay. that yeah. that is absent from 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 the literature. Okay. I, I did one other thing when Sharon Bowles was the head of the European Parliament for financial uh, markets. Uh, I had her on the phone with Richard Komoto, and she was in Strasbourg, and she said, "We have to ban repo." Well, close Europe then, right? There'd be no financial system because the central banks actually wanted the market. To, to do secured financing. Now, another very interesting thing, which I probably won't mention when I sit in the ECB, actually ECB doesn't do repo, they do sell buybacks. Because the market was used to the, you know, when the European Monetary Institute was looking at how do we do this, uh, the market already had repo markets since 1995, I think in Belgium and France. And so to not to confuse the market, they call it repo, but actually the ECB in essence does buy sell backs. 
And I, I remember this vividly because probably 15 years ago, in the, in, within this year, but this is off the record, right? Actually, the lawyers Are we of recording? Not yet. Because, yes, it is actually different. If I may jump in, because I actually have a question, yeah. if you want. Uh, so yeah. I, I'm also very puzzled by it, because my understanding is that repo markets in the different uh, national jurisdictions have had the tendency of using different kind of repos. For example, from my reading, Italy, the Italian repo market has tended to be more buy sell back, whereas the German repo market actually was proper repos. And uh, something that I, I haven't really found anything uh, written on or uh, any information about is why has the, the European monetary, uh, the project of the European unification allowed for different uh, sections, different uh, market segments to use different types of repos, uh, buy, buy, sell back and repos, which, okay, in accounting wise, I was uh, I, I was told that they have to be yeah. the same because they, they, yeah. the exposure is, is the same one and with balance sheet, we want to record exposure. But uh, it, it always remained a, a little bit of a question mark in my mind. Why would the ECB allow for this repo market, which were, as you were part of the German Union Group, you know, were supposed to be integrating. Why did we allow for them to remain legally di different? We are still trying to integrate, right? It's not finished. 25 years later, unfortunately, Alberto is not with us anymore, but it was one of his frustrations, you know? How can we move the national member states to drop their domestic superiority and, and go to for one euro currency we have, but we don't have one collective management, right? You know, the, you know, the common issuance is something, one of my babies, it will never happen. And why will it not happen? Germany can find itself much cheaper than the GC, if you want to call it. Why would they give up their benefit of having such a jewel in the crown, right? Same for the, uh, the repo market started before the euro, right? So we had in Germany the Raman Vertrag, in France we had Pension Livre, you know, we had all those different terminologies. So the ECB, you know, and the European Monetary Institute, and I know the people who were there at the time, and some of them are still there, had to find a common way to describe what's actually quite different because of the legal status of property law in the whole of the European Union. And so that's why, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a true European, right? And I said, not on the commission and meetings. We, it, it's, I think we, there was a huge historical mistake made when we created the euro. Not so much because yeah, the currency, I think, is will stay, the, the no collateral framework supported by the ECB has been used quite cleverly in all the crises. But what we haven't looked at is the post rate, the infrastructure. We have 27 CSDs. We have a few CCPs, which I can accept. The, the, the infrastructure we have since the last 30 years isn't fit for purpose for the true Euro collateral market. And that, I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what I know. This is an ongoing work in the Capital Markets Union project that will continue for the next in the next commission, right? That's all I can say. That's all I know. One, one thing that um, uh, is frustrating, and I think your, that's why your study is good, it raises a lot of other questions, right? Side questions. Uh, why, when the ECB created all their instruments for the intervention, right? Uh, they, uh, wanted, they wanted to QE, right? They were gonna buy, sovereign debts from all the Euro countries, right? But why did they give it the majority to the national central banks of the country? So, so, so I went again, I flew to Frankfurt, I had 20 people in front of me. I said, look, you have to create automatic lending and borrowing. Yeah, but this is difficult because the Italian was it in Italy and the German was in Germany. Exactly, why can't you centralize? Ah, we cannot because the governing council had decided each, and you know, you can record it, but I often say this in public, Everybody wants to be the president and the vice president and a secretary and flower home and a chauffeur. And so the, the, the basically the human nature uh, is such that uh, why would you agree to cut the branch on which you sit, right? It's, it's basically the, the thing that's happened. And that's a problem with Europe and the repo market actually suffers a lot about that because we have the mandatory buy now through the CSDR regulation. 
ICMA and the Steel Vacuum that have created, and this may be a bit aside from their study, shaping. The Fed has actually obliged anybody, anybody who trades treasuries, only to do lots of 50 million US treasuries. But in Europe, hedge funds, they want to do 500 million, no? It's nice, it's a big ticket. Yeah, but if you fail 1 million of 500 million, you fail on 500 million and not on one that you don't have. So we look for efficiencies to go around all those legacy problems we have. We also have partialing. If I have, I have to give you 50 million and I only have 45, why don't I set up the 45? And the five we can see and find it in the automatic lending and borrowing. And that's another problem, you know, that's not only used by the two ICSDs, the national uh, um, CSDs don't use this. And that is why the ripple market is not perfect. It will never be perfect, but it, we still have so many fears. Now the debate, and this is interesting, the America is going to T plus one, right? From T plus two, also is Canada. India has done it already. In Europe, we cannot do this because we cannot settle at T plus zero in most jurisdictions. So, so apart from accounting, um, you know, I think your study, your study has value, but there's a lot of things, particularly the Gordon metric, right? This is a joke. It's not, it's absolutely wrong. And we have been fighting against Gordon metric in, in, in on, online Zooms. The repo market is actually the one that helped uh, create, a, create a clean house after the Lehman default. No, nothing else. So I have more, but uh, I stop here, right? I can talk all day if you want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Gottfried. And uh, it might be also uh, a good piece of information for um, at least Matteo and Alex that, um, or at least uh, Gottfried is going to be in June in Frankfurt. And um, I don't know if all of you are coming, but if you are coming, uh, um, those of you who are coming have a chance then to also connect uh, with him directly. You and I has had a last minute um, redirection will unfortunately not make it to uh, Frankfurt. Uh, I will give uh, maybe you, Matteo and Alex, uh, a chance to respond to the discussions. And I think then we will leave it there as we would have uh, hit the um, timing of our webinar. So I hand it over to the two of you. Just uh, one sh short observation to call it this way. I expect it was as uh, got with one one last at the beginning, but uh, about the Gordon and Matrix, yeah, this is basically these two authors who are part of our introduction, and we basically uh, copied their argument. I know that Igma mm -hmm. overly criticized Gordon and Matrix, uh, Matrix, but uh, yeah, we uh, we argued that the repos. Uh, Basically, repos uh, elevated the real that real estate crisis because we quoted Gordon and uh, Metric. This is uh, all yeah. I wanted to say, and uh, thank you both uh, for uh, for your valuable feedback. Yes, I'll uh, I'll um, I'll say a thing. So um, I was interested about the the the, the first comment. That was made on the on the numbers because the seventy percent actually comes from the 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 data by the ECB. Now I don't have it. On, uh, uh, the ECB right only or ECB only collects from a number of banks and not not uh, so. Okay. So they don't see they don't see the corporate bond uh, repo, for instance, trade weapons. So it's not part. Okay. Then, have that. then my question is because why isn't this made clear when one looks at the data? <laughs> There is no well, asterisk I, in terms of what is included I, and what isn't. Yeah, I, when I when I, I shot this repo survey 25 years ago, right? And then the ECB came up through their money market. Are we going to collect also from our banks? It's only European-based banks, right? It's not the London-based banks now and all that stuff. And so they actually asked ICMA to continue the repo survey. And we actually matched the two. And the trends are the same. But the base on what this is, is totally different. Now, I also know ESMA has SFTR data now. They don't have systems. They don't have money to data mine that. That's now being looked at in Paris. And my question was, who's going to pay for it? The banks. So, you know, there is another uh, initiative who has asked me actually to join them as well as a consultant, but I haven't made up my mind yet. And they're actually data mining what the banks give to ESMA because ESMA cannot find the tree in the middle of the woods. And so this group has now the funding to actually, when banks want it, 
the banks can give it to them and they will actually do the analysis that what Exma should actually be doing. But that will take five more years, right? And a lot of lobbying behind the scene. So, so yes, I, I, it's confusing. So, so be very careful with data because, you know, straight away I look for the representation. I have it here, right? 25% of the 10 trillion, which is only the beginning. Eh? One thing on the balance sheet is interesting, actually, uh, Alex, as well. I'm in the expert group uh, for mandatory clearing for pension funds created by the by the parliament. The last, next meeting is before June, and then they have to start mandatory clearing for their derivatives on CCPs, uh, hopefully all in Euroland Euro base, right? Iona, not in the UK. Uh, and um, there, uh, they can only, they only have to start with new trades. But the problem was that the banks have no balance sheet to have the, the pension funds and insurance companies over the end of the year. So I've had discussions in, with the Dutch Ministry of Finance and the St. Nederlandse Bank. Uh, we had a crisis a few years ago. And um, the, the end of the discussion was in February after the end of the year. If the Dutch banks have a lack of balance sheet for the pension funds in Holland, then we will create T-bills for three days over a year end because that's not on balance sheet. So there is all kinds of ways around this balance sheet, right? So you, you have to look at a very broad picture and and you know and then narrow it down like Iona said. What is your definition of repo? Right there it starts. And then I, I don't know if you're going to rewrite this whole study. I find it you know I've read similar things uh, not the same, but I find I, you know, I get very hot about it. Right as you can see. So if I may, maybe yeah. so first uh, thanks a lot for the mention on this pension fund. Uh, like, uh, one thing, one thing if I may is uh, you also make a reference to the sovereign debt crisis, right? Um, we had the 2008 uh, financial crisis. We had the 2012 sovereign debt crisis. In between, there was a meeting in the in the Geneva Group, which is uh, hosted by the Swiss National Bank with all the vice governors of the world. I was also invited with academics, um, you know, uh, quite a few of them. And I asked the question before the sovereign debt crisis: Have you looked at what's happening with government bonds as collateral? Don't you see there is going to be pressure there? Then Mr. De Vitz asked the question and nobody dared to answer, right? Because it was before the sovereign debt crisis. I, I actually was um, indirectly, but not directly, in touch with Jean-Paul Trichet, who was governor of the Bank de France, to allow us, the market, to create a bridge between ClearNet SA and CCNG Italy to clear Italian repos in the two CCPs, and that they would take the risk against each other. The problem then in the sovereign debt crisis was that CCNG, the Italian CCP, only had Italian participants, and the French CCP had only non-Italian participants. So nobody wanted to clear anymore. They did bilateral trades, the international banks, not to be contaminated on the high risk between those two CCPs, where ClearNet had more than 80% of government bonds of Italy in their default uh, basket, which would have been unworkable in case of, of the theoretical default, right? I don't think sovereigns in Europe will ever go default. They can print money like the UK is doing at the moment, right? <laughs> but it, it's, it, you know, I have a rich history of many anecdotes as well, right? But it shows you how, how complex repo is. It's not, and it's, and it's very, very necessary that we continue to work on capital marketing and fix all those legacy problems. I stop there. So if I may just jump in a second, because uh, to, to, to respond to Joanna, I, I agree, but th th that is the issue that because we wanted precisely to show that uh, the fact that different uh, securities used as collateral carry different risk and they behave yeah. in different ways. And the, the issue that we come up with is that in the literature, nobody really represents repos by specifying what is the collateral for that repo. Yeah. So it, yeah. accounting wise, if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the balance sheet or uh, the T accounts that any kind of academic uh, paper uh, uses, you will never see the kind of, uh, of asset used as collateral in the consideration or in the discussion of repos, which is what left us a little perplexed about what uh, what uh, uh, we um, uh, how we how could we. Uh, use that notation to discuss the Eurozone crisis, because what we wanted to show is precisely the fact that repos yeah. uh, acted as, um, well, they acted as um, a, a, a one of the sources, uh, well, they, they played a, a critical role for uh, for, so, for sovereign, uh, for, for sovereign uh, bond markets. Yeah. So, so I appreciate massively over time. Just one sentence on that. 
and that's why I say you have to type. No, no, it, it, it does. Uh, yes, of course, because I understand that um, what we call repo can be uh, uh, undefined in a sense. You don't understand, uh, it's difficult to understand whether uh, which one of the different uh, approaches uh, we follow. Uh, and it's repo and reverse repo. So, you know, you should say cash lender or cash borrower. That's much easier to understand for people who have no clue what we're talking about. Yeah, we do that by discussing special and general collateral. So in, in a sense, in the paper, we end up discussing special and general collateral. But, but, but there's, also, there's also a misnomer. But for somebody is a special, for another is GC. What, sorry? A, a, a one particular bond, right? Can yeah. be special for somebody, but it is a GC for somebody yeah. else who for him is no value. So you have to say the lending yeah. cash or lending, or lending collateral. That makes it much, much easier yeah. to understand for the little bit. Yeah. So am I booked uh, to go to Frankfurt, Gerard? Can I book my tickets? You, you, you're always good. Uh, uh, you, you're referring, though, to uh, the ECB Monetary? event. And that's something yeah. where latest going to take up in May. Uh, uh, but you know, I, mean, I, I hear you speak. I mean, if they don't let you in, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna let, do the uh, door like this a little bit and say, you uh, know, this guy needs to go in. I, I've, um, I've been many times in that conference room, and I'm always the one who asked the first question. They know me for that as well. So. <laughs> Um, um, so book, uh, I think, I'll Matthew, you have, uh, you have had your response, and so it's time um, to come to an end. Uh, thank you very much, Gottfried. Thank you very much, Iona. Thank you very much to the two presenters, um, um, Alex and Matteo, for uh, this uh, webinar that we just had. It was very um, enlightened. Um, I look forward to seeing many of you in Frankfurt. And just to mention, um, in Frankfurt, there's also going to be present um, uh, Klaus Löber and Frau Klein Wendt, both from ESMA, who have been mentioned. So you can take that conversation even up with them as well. So thank you again one more time and then see you okay. hopefully soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you.